Let's take our Bibles and open them up this morning to Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. This is one of the last messages in our series on victorious Christian living. I've entitled this sermon, Victorious in Service. Victorious in Service. As we think about the importance of encouraging one another, the Bible has a lot to say about the ministry of encouragement. I want you to think about this morning, not that I want you to dwell on that, but I want you to think about times perhaps in your life when you were discouraged. What got you to that place? What caused you perhaps to to focus on those feelings? Because discouragement, I believe, is one of the greatest uh, areas in which our enemy seeks to use for our spiritual downfall. Now, please, make sure that you hear me correctly and listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. I believe that discouragement can be influenced by outside factors, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, but ultimately it's decisions that we make, choosing to become discouraged. But we know that God has given many, many examples and many, many verses of encouragement for us to look to and for us to meditate upon so that we can have victory in our walk in life. So that we don't uh, get to this place where we're no longer wanting to serve God. Now this morning as I was talking to our, my sons in my office, we were talking about the importance of ministry. We talked about we've been going through the fruit of the Spirit. We were talking about how uh, patience or long-suffering enables us to continue to press on and serve the Lord even when it's difficult. And there are two aspects to the word serve or ministry. Sometimes the word serve, like in Psalm 100, the Bible says serve the Lord with gladness. Serve means the way that we worship God. But serve also carries with it the idea of what we're doing in the way of ministry, how we're serving the Lord. And may I say this, your life is your ministry. Every aspect of it. Oftentimes we might think of a title of leadership that we may have within the church, and that certainly is ministry. Whether you're a deacon or a trustee, whether you're a Sunday school teacher or a Christian school teacher here at Tabernacle Christian School, or whether you help out with the maintenance of the, of the building or you teach and preach on a regular basis, we call that ministry, and rightfully so. But your life is ministry. And so having said that, I'm going to draw a parallel this morning between our text of Scripture in Nehemiah chapter 4 about serving God as we understand it, serving the Lord with our lives, to what they were doing, the people of Judah, that's where the name Jew comes from, people who are Jewish or Judah, the people of Judah with Nehemiah rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. So I want to make sure that we understand that right away, and that will be the, pretty much the basis of this message. Nehemiah chapter 4. So as we think about it, discouragement is the biggest tool that our enemy uses in an effort to hinder us or to defeat us. It's a devastating attitude that can, have, that can make us feel unworthy, hopeless, and has the potential to even steal the joy of our heart. Think about it. When David finally got right with God, King David cried out in Psalm 51, Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. In essence, he was saying, Lord, I want the joy, or I want that purpose of living. Oftentimes, discouragement blinds us from what God desires greatly of us, and that is to enjoy fellowship with him and service to him and others. If discouragement is not quickly defeated, listen, church, it will invade our minds. It will open the door to doubt, to loneliness, to anger, frustration, and even, and even depression. Dr. Michael Youssef, in an article that he wrote on Leading the Way, said this, any time you begin to gain victory over sin, triumph over addiction, consistency in your prayer life, boldly sharing your faith with those around you, don't be surprised at the spiritual opposition that comes your way. He went on to write, the devil's goal is to prevent God's people from attempting great things for God and to keep them from growing in the Christian life. And I agree with that. 
And I think it's important that we recognize that discouragement seeks to sidetrack us from God's purpose in our life. God has called his people to serve him faithfully and consistently, but oftentimes we face the enemy of discouragement. We may not always know when it's happening. That's why it's important to have good friends that can come alongside of us and say, is everything okay? When someone asks you that question, don't take offense to it. Maybe you can give an answer. Well, I'm dealing with this or I'm struggling with this. Be honest. That's the whole point of the church family, that we love each other and we care for one another and that we can confide in one another perhaps. And it's then that we must choose to serve the Lord for his glory and by his strength and by his power. Let me give you a little background of our text. From the book of Nehemiah, our text reveals how the people of Judah faced the potential of discouragement while building the wall and how Nehemiah, God's choice leader, helped them to overcome their enemy and find victory. So let's look this morning, first of all, at the fuel that empowers the enemy of discouragement and then eventually we'll examine the biblical ways to overcome it, all right? So let's begin, first of all, with the fuel that empowers the enemy of discouragement. Verse 1 of Nehemiah chapter 4 reads this way, but it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth, which is another word for angry, but it's like a next level. It's a form of wrath. It's the idea of he was really, really mad. And he took great indignation, and he mocked the Jews. Verse 2 reads, and he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, even that which they built, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. I want you to know, first of all, what are the fuel of that empowers the enemy of discouragement is ridicule, mockery. Ridicule and mockery from other people can cause us to question our calling and sometimes even question our service. Because sometimes there may be an element of truth in the ridicule, we may allow their words to distract us from doing what God has called us to do. There was a mess for them to clean up. It was an overwhelming task. And some of the things that they were being teased about, it almost sounds like a bunch of little kids the way that they're talking, right? But these are grown men, these feeble Jews. What are they going to do with all this rubbish? But God had commissioned them to go. God would empower them to do the work. And sometimes the way in which we are mocked and ridiculed, perhaps even for our faith, causes us to start becoming a bit discouraged. Hopefully and prayerfully, you can have that resolve, that endurance that says, even if the whole world rejects me, I know what the Bible says, that God is true. We're going to see later on that Nehemiah encourages them to remind them of who God is. But sometimes, again, as I said before, because of ridicule, because of mockery, you know, for me, I'm one of those people, I've always been this way, it's just a, more of a personality trait, that I'm not really bothered by what other people think as much. If I know something is right, kind of a black or white person that way. If it's right, I'll do it. If it's wrong, I won't do it. And that's how I do it. I'm not really influenced. But other people sometimes are influenced by their peers or influenced by other people to the point where they may even capitulate or they may even uh, change their opinion. Someone said this about discouragement. Discouragement is such a powerful weapon because it is somewhat the opposite of faith where faith believes God and his love and his promises, discouragement sometimes looks for and even believes the worst and tends to pretty much forget about God, who is and what he has promised to do. So they were saying this to them. They were saying, look at it says in verse 3, even if a fox goes up, not a very large animal, he shall even break down their stone wall. Ridicule is a tool of discouragement that sometimes pre penetrates deep into our soul. Even as adults, we can be influenced that way. Don't let that hinder you from serving the Lord. Let's continue reading. Notice what it says if you skip down to verse 7. But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites, uh, Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, 
Then they were very wroth. And you almost read this like, what is their problem? Why can't they just leave them alone? But notice what it says in verse 8. And conspired all of them, all of these people groups, together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to, notice the next word, hinder it, to stop it. Satan only goes after those who are serious about serving God. And sometimes the way that happens through discouragement is, yes, it could be from ridicule and mockery, but can also be weariness. And I'm not just talking about being regular tired, a long day's work or doing some yard work in your house or whatever it may be. We're all naturally tired and we all should get enough sleep. I'm reminding that to my children who are going to be waking up a lot earlier soon as we're getting ready for school than they have been. And all the other kids are looking at each other like, yes, we know, Pastor Small. You know, when we're sleeping, we get rest. Your body needs rest. But here, weariness is sometimes when it's beyond just the normal physical rest, when you're exhausted and you feel that way mentally and you feel that way spiritually speaking. You, you feel like throwing in the towel. Let's keep reading. In verse 9, Nehemiah says, Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them that day because of day and night, because of them. Now notice verse 10. That's our key verse. And Judah said, now this is all the people kind of voicing their concern, the strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed. And it wants us to understand something, that according to verse 6, the people of Judah were halfway in construction, but the Bible says that they were determined to work. In fact, it says that they had a mind to work, and literally it's the idea that their heart was determined to get it done. It's very similar to what the Bible talks about with Daniel in the Old Testament. The Bible says he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. That's a very similar phrase. That they had a mind to work, that they had purposed their heart. This is what they were going to get done. They were determined to do that. And oftentimes, we may become distracted in our desire to serve God because we become weary and we just say, well, I used to feel this way, but not anymore. It often occurs in the halfway point where discouragement sets in. When we progress to the midway, negative thoughts and doubts begin in our mind, and the things which seem to be possible, that God had given you clear vision, become hazy and distant and maybe even impossible. Discouragement comes at the point of no return where we can't start over, we can't relinquish, so sometimes we just quit. In the New Testament, the Bible gives us two encouraging words that sound very similar. In Galatians, the Bible says that we should not uh, faith, or the Bible says that we will reap what we sow. The Bible says don't be weary in well-doing, for we shall reap if we, uh, we shall reap if we faint not. Let me just read the verse that I have here. 2 Thessalonians 3.13 says, But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Well, how could that be? How could that be? Oftentimes, we may have a desire to do something, and we're moved and motivated by emotion only. There's nothing wrong with being emotional about something. We should. We should have a great desire to do things for the Lord in our families, in our church family, and at our jobs. Whatever, the Bible says, whatever thy hand findeth to do, do it what? Heartily as unto the Lord and not unto man. So there's nothing wrong with that. But if it's only that, and then that feeling, that emotion fades, all of a sudden we're like, yeah, I don't know if I want to keep doing this anymore. I don't know if this is really what God has called me to do, even though you know it's what God wants you to do. It cannot be emotion-based. Therefore, the weariness and well-doing oftentimes happens when we're seeking to serve God, and that weariness is an exhaustion. Why? Because we're not trusting God as much as we should. We're drawing upon our own resources, and God has told us that that's never going to work. Be not weary in well-doing, for we will reap if we faint not. Notice again in verses 10 and also verse 11, not only was there ridicule and mockery, not only was there weariness and that they were tired and they said the bearers of burdens is decayed and there's much rubbish, and they looked at this and said, well, the walls themselves are kind of breaking down. I'm trying to show a picture there of the weariness. But notice that there was fear. And not all fear is bad. We understand that. God puts that within our hearts naturally for us to understand certain things. There are warnings in nature. There are warnings within our own heart. We touch something that's hot, that's really, really hot, that could burn us. We, we have a fear. But sometimes the word fear means reverence and godly respect. And here the fear that I'm talking about deals with the very fact that Judah now says, our adversaries said, 
Now they learned this. They learned about the plans that were mentioned before, about all these different people groups gathering together to fight against them because they were rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. They shall not know, neither see, till we come, verse 11, in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. Not about you, but I've never had my life threatened before. I don't know if somebody secretly fought that against me. I don't really want to know that. But there might have been some times in which somebody's life may have been threatened. When we were in Jamaica, we went to Kingston in 2005. I was re thinking about the trip that we took in 2019 when we went down and ministered in Montego Bay. But in 2005, we didn't fly into Montego Bay and the resort part of the more of the vacation spot of Jamaica. We went to Kingston. In fact, when we flew into Kingston, the, uh, the lady that was at the, uh, the desk of our, of our airline said, you guys are missionaries, right? And I said, well, what makes you think that? She goes, the white people that come in, uh, that fly in, uh, usually fly into Montego Bay, not into Jamaica, or into Kingston. And Kingston, not only were we in a very tough city, but we happened to be ministering in a place called Trenchtown. Now, I had some concerned parents, and rightfully so, but as we were ministering there, God gave us many wonderful opportunities. We had about 185 kids at a vacation Bible school that we ministered every day. Uh, our kids did a wonderful job. It was just a great mission trip all in all. But as one night I was talking with a missionary that we were working with, and I said, how's everything going? Have you ever had been robbed or anything like that? And I don't know why I asked that question. He said, yeah, it's happened a few times, and it's just part of the culture. It just happens. There's a lot of theft. There's a lot of things that, that people steal. Just right out, They'll come right off into your, if you don't have it secured in your house, they'll just come right out of your front uh, lawn and just grab your bike and not think anything of it. And the police are like, we're not going to bother with that. If you've got something stolen from you, you should have locked it away. But then he told me a story about one of the men in the part that they're ministering in Trenchtown who came to him and threatened him. And he thought he was going to die. That's how he thought he was going to be meeting the Lord. I remember he told me the story. And this guy is a big guy like me, about my same height, build, and everything. And he thought he was very fearful of his life. You know, he prayed to the Lord, but he was prepared to deal with whatever was going to happen. Prayerfully, he got the man to calm down, <laughs> put his knife away, gave him some money, and the man went on his way. You know that fear that comes inside of you. There's a type of fear that often happens when we know that our enemy, our enemy, even the world, is seeking to destroy us. And that's why we have to take serious what it means to be in battle. This is not nation ball. This is not volleyball. This is not some sport. When the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, there's a spiritual adversary, Satan and his enemies, who are seeking to tear us down. Peter even says, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary, your enemy. The devil walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Do you see how serious that is? And so the fear that we have should lead us to a reverential dependence upon God. We should trust in God. We know he's our heavenly father. We know he's watching over us. But the fear that was here was real. They said, they shall not know, neither see, till they all come in the midst among them and shall slay them and cause the work to cease. It was very difficult. They did not have natural protection. The Jews who are working on the wall become, became well aware of their enemy's plans, not only to stop them, but to destroy them. We notice, and we'll see in just a little bit, that they both prayed and prepared. Prayer should not be viewed as a last resort. Prayer should be something we see as a mighty weapon. Discouragement can set in when our focus is more on the enemy than upon our God. You hear what I just said? Discouragement can set in when our focus becomes more on the enemy than our God. Fear can lead us to question our own fortitude and perhaps whether the calling is worth it. But it is worth it. Continue to press on. Continue to serve the Lord. Continue to rebuild the walls. The work was difficult. They had no good defense, which made them very easy targets. And so the fear that they had was a natural fear. But at the same time, it could have become a discouraging fear. I want you to hold your place in Nehemiah, because we're going to come back to there in just a moment. But I want you to go to the 118th Psalm. 118, Psalm 118. We're going to read this beautiful psalm together. It's a great psalm. 
And I love it. We're going to start reading in verse 6. The psalm reads, the, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It's better to trust in the Lord than to do what? To put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Verse 10. All nations compassed me about. They're all around me. But in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. They compassed me about. Yea, they compassed me about. But in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. They compassed me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns. For in the name of the Lord I will destroy them. Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall. But the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song and is become my salvation. Go back to Nehemiah chapter 4. We've looked at the fuel that empowers the attitude or spirit of discouragement. Now I want to transition to the steps to overcome the enemy of discouragement. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, there may be times in which you become discouraged. I hope that's a very short season in your life. I've been discouraged before, and I'm sure that you have too. But we didn't, I didn't stay in that state of mind. And I am encouraged to know that God is ever with me that he will hear my prayer. I'm encouraged to look out to see your faces. I truly mean that. Behind the masks. And for those that are watching at home, I'm encouraged that you're watching, and I hope that eventually you'll be able to come out and be part of our service together. In Nehemiah chapter 4, we're going to go all the way back to verse 4, and notice that the first step of overcoming the enemy of discouragement is to pray to our Heavenly Father is to pray. Notice in verse 4, he says, Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity. Let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. For Nehemiah, prayer was his first response, not his last resort. When times of opposition come, God wants us to rely upon him. And the purest way of, re of expressing our reliance upon God is through prayer. That we pray, that we tell God all the things that he already knows, but we're sharing with God our concerns, and we're asking God to move in a mighty way to help us. When discouraged, we need to focus on God and pray to him. Prayer brings victory. Prayer is the best antidote for discouragement. I love what it says in 1 Peter 5, verses, verse 7. And I, I don't know if you remember this, but a message that I brought in 2017, and I, and I was looking up some illustrations about this, but I had one of those radio flyer red wagons. Do you remember this? And we had those bricks, and I think some of these were these cardboard bricks that we had from the nursery that they used to build castle walls. And I had people just write down areas of worry or areas of concern, and everybody wrote that we kind of, we, we taped them on, and we put them in the bucket, or put them in the, uh, the wagon, and I shared this verse, and I preached onto it. Then I had, I think Chris Michaelman came up to help me, and we took that wagon, and we just literally dumped it out. And the idea of casting means exactly that. Just take everything that's a care, which is just another word for worries, or the things that are on your heart, casting all your cares upon who? What does it say in 1 Peter 5, 7? Casting all your cares upon him, God, for he careth for you. And that's the point. Discouragement sets in when we think, God doesn't really care about me. But he does, more than perhaps we even understand. So pray to God. Number two, not only should we pray to God, but prepare for battle. Prepare for battle. Notice in verse 13, he says to them in verse 12, and it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, the other Jews that were living in the land, they said unto us ten times, from all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. That was their warning. They're coming after you. They mean business. Verse 13, Therefore set I in the lower places behind the wall, and on the higher places I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. There was a preparation. And part of spiritual battle is to have not a, just a reactionary way of viewing things, but a prepared heart and a prepared mind so that when temptations come our way, we know how to properly battle. 
were ready to do that. After learning of the enemy's plans, Nehemiah organized a defensive system, but notice very carefully, it was based upon their families. The greatest concern that I have is for all of our families to be strong individually. All different representations of different families in the, in the sense of, of that. Different ages and different amounts of children and ages of children and whatever family that means. But we all come together as the family of God here at Tabernacle Baptist Church. So we think about this. Isn't it interesting that that's how they set it up? Based upon their families. The fathers being ready to fight for their family, perhaps with their sons, and the families were much larger, perhaps, than how we think of the traditional family today, with brothers and sisters and their spouses and everyone together, ready to fight, ready. They were prepared. Spiritual preparation is necessary when the enemy of discouragement seeks to destroy you and your heart for the Lord. Oftentimes, that's the concern about uh, about discouragement is that it can cause us to lose heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, when Paul was talking about the spiritual battle, he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, meaning they're not fleshly, they're not physical, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now listen to what it says in verse 5. Casting down imaginations. And when we think of imaginations, we might think of just dreaming about something and thinking about something, using your imagination, being thoughtful. But it is indeed that idea that we're thinking, it's talking about our thought life, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Our minds and our hearts need to be prepared to deal with these doubts and deal with these areas of discouragement in which we know they're not right and good. So we pray and we prepare, but notice in verse 14, we also remember, we remember the God that loves us. Notice in verse 14, the Bible says, and I, this is Nehemiah speaking, I looked and rose up and I said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, he was addressing a very large crowd, hundreds of thousands of people. He said, be not ye afraid of them. Now it's one thing to say that, it's another thing to do it. Nehemiah was counting himself in this group, however large this group was. He says, the next three words are powerful. He says, remember the Lord. Discouragement causes us to have temporary spiritual amnesia. We start looking in, we start thinking, we're the source of the solution, not God. He is both great and terrible. And fight for your brethren, for your sons and your daughters, your wives, and your houses. What does it mean to remember the Lord? Nehemiah reminded Judah that their God, the one true God, he says earlier that it was our God. He was both great and terrible. Well, we know what the word great means. I think that's easy to define. Powerful, mighty. But why the word terrible? When you eat something that's not good, usually you say, oh, that was terrible. Or maybe you watched a movie that was really bad, and you're like, oh, that was terrible. And sometimes we use that word terrible in a negative way. But the word terrible is an older English word that implies something that means to bring about fear and trembling. It's the sense of God's, uh, God's power and his strength being demonstrated. In Psalm 66, verses 1, 2, and 3, the psalm reads this way. Make a joyful noise unto God, all ye lands. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Then it says, say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy works. Then it says, through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. We need to be reminded of the greatness of God, that we are on God's side. Remember that God is always with you, and especially when you are in trouble. We need to focus on God, who is bigger than any of our problems. Corey Ten Boom said this, if you look at the world, you'll be distressed. If you look within, you might be depressed. But if you look to the Lord, you will be at rest. What caused the people of Judah to find rest? They knew that a fight could be coming, and they were prepared for that. They had prayed. They said, Lord, be with us, and he was. But Nehemiah was encouraging them to remember how great and mighty God was, that God would fight for them and with them. 
Which leads to the fourth way in which we can overcome the spirit of discouragement, and that is to actually be strong and fight. There's one thing to prepare, it's another thing to actually fight. We are in spiritual battles, and overcoming discouragement involves the actual fighting. Not just saying, well, I know sometimes I have these feelings, but it's the fighting of that. It's the resisting of that. So much of scripture involves the very fact that we are in a spiritual battle, not that we might be. Nehemiah called for the people to fight and to fight for their families. I know that the fathers and grandfathers here wouldn't think anything about it if someone was trying to harm their children. We would defend our families, no problem at all. And so this appeal by Nehemiah to fight for their family stirred in them emotions to get them to be ready to do that. Discouragement can be contagious. Discouragement can be contagious. And it can even infiltrate a home if it is not defeated. Don't allow the enemy to hinder you from the purpose of God. Be an overcomer and fight and fight and fight against it. You are a child of God. You are an heir of the kingdom of God. You've been made complete in Christ. Live and fight in the reality of that identity. Reject discouragement for what it is. I, I like somebody's definition of discouragement. They said, it's just a desperate attempt from a false messenger to steal from you not only the joy of the Lord, but also the purpose of your calling. I like that. That's why in 1 Timothy chapter 6, Timothy received exhortation from his spiritual father in the Lord when Paul said this, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Learn till thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. It probably was at times difficult for Timothy because of his age, because of other things, for him to get discouraged like it is for others at times who are serving the Lord. But that is not something that we should dwell upon. We should continually move forward. So we're prepared to fight. We're praying. We are um, remembering the Lord and his goodness, goodness. And fifth and finally, I want you to notice from verses 15 through 18, return to the work. Sometimes we go through seasons of doubt and discouragement. We get to this place where we're maybe off track a little bit, and we get set right so that we're moving back in the right place. Return to work. Get back to doing what God has called you to do. Notice in verse 15, And it came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, now watch, and God had brought their counsel to naught. I love that. See, it would have been easy for Judah to say, hey, guys, we did it, look. And they could have patted themselves on the back and said, look what a great job we did. We scared them. But it says, and God had brought their counsel to naught. They were prepared. They prayed. But they remembered God. They were willing to fight. It says that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of my servants wrought in the work and the other half of them held both the spears and the shields and the bows and the uh, habergeons, habergeons and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They, they which builded on the wall and they which bear burdens with those that laded everyone, uh, everyone with one of his hands wrought in the work and with the other hand held a weapon. Awesome to think about. They were prepared. But God had caused their work, their plan, their enemies' plans to cease. And God gave Nehemiah and the people of Judah victory without a single casualty. That's what I hope and pray for each and every one. I don't know where you're at in your walk with the Lord. Some of you I know a little bit more than others. And as I seek to minister to you in the truest sense of the word with my wife and others, there may be some areas in your life you're just saying, hey, I just need to talk. And sometimes you just need to get some things off of your chest. And it's good for that. It's good to have godly counsel. It's good to have friends that you can look to and go to and say, I need to talk to you about this. When we return to work, we go back to doing what God has called us to do. While they worked, they remained aware of their enemy, even more so than before. There's an interesting New Testament parallel to this, and it's found in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says, So then they see then that ye walk circumspectly. And what this word means is where we get the idea of like circumference. It's all the way around. That we're aware of everything behind us, to the side, 
above us, below us, and ahead of us. We're aware of that. The spiritual challenge that Paul gave to the church at Ephesus, see that you walk, that you live your life circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, but, or, or, it, uh, yeah, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are, are evil. Then it says, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. What has God called you to do? So maybe at one point in time, you had a greater passion for serving God than you do now. Why did that change? Why did that change? Maybe you're discouraged because you found a disagreement with someone or, or something happened as you were serving the Lord or some other problem, whatever it may be, and I'm not trying to be insensitive to that. But deal with the source of that and say, Lord, continue to point me in the right direction so that I am continually encouraged to, to serve you, wherever that may be. Discouragement was one of the greatest weapons of our enemy in order to cause us to lose our purpose and to hinder our ministry. At some point in our journeys of faith, faith we will face discouragement. But what matters most is how we properly and biblically handle it. When discouragement drags you down and tries to make you unproductive, remember God and his promises. God promises to renew our strength. When we are under spiritual attack, it is very easy to feel that just enduring the storm is the victory. It isn't. The attack often comes to prevent your progress and work for the Lord. Victory is not only enduring the attack, but it's continuing to progress and work for the Lord. Ultimately, we must die daily to the attitude of discouragement. And we must not allow this enemy to enter into our hearts and minds, for if we do, we will lose sight of our calling to serve the Lord. I want to close this sermon by giving you the personal testimony of a woman named Johnny Erickson Tata. Some of you may have heard of her. She was a woman that had a tragic accident when she was just a teenager. She was a, a diver, swimmer. I think she was a swimmer. And she dove off of a dock and she didn't realize the depth of the water, and she actually hit a, hit a rock, I believe, and it caused her to have complete paralysis from her neck down. And she said this concerning her ministry and her calling, and how she battled the spirit of discouragement. She writes, please know that when I take up my cross every day, I am not talking about my wheelchair. My wheelchair is not my cross to bear. Neither is your cane or your walker, your cross. Neither is your job that seems very difficult or irksome in-laws. I don't know what that is. But your cross to bear is not your migraine headaches, not your sinus infections, not your stiff joints. That is not your cross to bear. My cross is not my wheelchair. It is my attitude. Your cross is your attitude. Any complaints, any grumblings, any disputings or murmurings, any anxieties, any worries, resentments, or anything that hints of a raging torrent of bitterness and discouragement. These are the thing, things that God calls me to die to daily. For when I do, I not only become like him in his death, but the power of the resurrection puts to death any doubts and fears, grumblings and disputings. And I get to become like him in his life. I get to experience the intimate fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, the sweetness and the preciousness of the Savior, I become holy as he is holy. I don't know if you're discouraged this morning. Maybe it's to do with what's going on with COVID-19. I've tried not to let that discourage me. I hope you're trying not to let that discourage you as well. Perhaps there's some other issues that maybe nobody knows about that you're dealing with. You could see what the Bible says about discouragement, about a spirit of fear and anger and frustration and worry, fretting, causes weariness, causes even depression, all these things. God has told us to delight in him, to draw strength from him. And I want to encourage you to do that. As heads are bowed. And